Okay, okay, thanks so much. Um, okay, I'm gonna do a live demo here, so watch out. Uh, wish me luck. Um, okay, so I won't go full slide here, but this is um, a demo on opening and looking at 3D files. So let's start with the talking about the OBJ. Uh, the OBJ file format is a simple data format that represents 3D geometry, namely the position of each vertex, the coordinates of the texture, and the faces that make each, <clears throat> each polygon defined as a list of vertices and texture vertices. OBJs can encode the surface geometry of a 3D model, but also store color and texture information. And the material template library format or MTL file is often a companion file to the OBJ that describes the surface shading or material properties of the 3D object within one or more OBJ files. So let me jump over, let me just move this Zoom thing really quick. Let me jump over, I'm gonna jump over to my uh, CAD program uh, called Autodesk Maya here. Uh, can everyone see that? Yes. yes. Great, okay, so I have this connector here and uh, this connector, it's, it's in the test prints and it's been a theme. Um, so here I have it as an OBJ file inside my CAD program. Just because um, we talked about CAD programs, but we haven't uh, looked at them too much, I can um, I can select the object itself. This is a 3D gizmo here. I can move on the X, Y, and Z axes around. I can manipulate it. I can um, hit the E key to rotate and the R key to scale. Um, if I hit the center, I universally scale and uh, these different widgets let me um, go on different axes. Um, I can also sit my center mouse and I can manipulate directly vertices, faces, or edges. So here I've selected vertices. I hit the translate key and then I can move that out. I'm not going to do some nice model, but I just wanted to show you how one might manipulate a model in a 3D CAD program. Anyway, so this is the OBJ uh, file in Maya, and so we're looking at a, at a visual representation of it. If I export, if I select this object, select it, and then file export selection. Uh, in this particular, in Maya, I have a lot of options as I do in many other programs. Uh, so I have an OBJ export and STL export and a lot of other file formats that we won't get into because they're not so apropos for 3D printing. Um, I already exported it. Um, so now I'm going to bring it into my fun uh, text editor. This is Visual Studio Code. It's an excellent text editor. If you're looking at files, um, I highly recommend it. It's free. I'll send a link out um, at the end. But if you look at the OBJ file, that references an MTL file that describes the material. And then we have a series of vertices on the X, Y, and Z coordinates. And so these vertices, um, if I go back into Maya here, and I turn this to the uh, wireframe, you'll see it's a, composed of a bunch of triangles in this case. And um, each of these points in the text file represents um, a point in space of vertices um, that make up these triangles here. Now I have another file because uh, OBJ it, uh, describes geometry, but it also describes texture. There's not much of a texture on here because I um, downloaded it from an STL and so it just kind of this gray texture and I can look at this texture file and it has a description of the value of this sort of that gray texture. But if I look at um, this one, this milkshake here, it has a lot more texture, uh, an image texture actually. And so um, if I export that as an OBJ, which I did. I again have my vertices and it also refers to this material file, which is this shape material, references an image. And then it has a bunch of uh, what are meant as UV coordinates that wrap this weird looking image. Um, there's a whole process one would do in CAD to texture an image. Um, and it wraps this image around uh, the 3D file. So it looks like that. And so a lot of 3D printers 
you know, material is not super important, but there are printers that do pigmentation. And so uh, that may be of value. Now, if I go back to my slides, um, uh, so that was a, the, a quick look at OBJ. Now let's talk about STL. Uh, STL is a format created by the company 3D Systems. Uh, it's the answer to standard triangle language, standard tessellation language. Um, it's super supported by many uh, software packages for uh, uh, digital fabrication, uh, 3D printing, computer, e manufacturing. But SD files only describe the surface geometry of a dimensional object without any representation of color, texture, common CAD model attributes. Uh, an SDL file describes a raw, unstructured, triangulated surface. And oh, another great point is STL files can be stored as binary ASCII files. Um, now, another point is an STL file represents surface geometry using facets. Facets define the surface of a 3D object uh, and is uniquely defined uh, by a unit normal, which is a line pointing out uh, per perpendicular uh, to the triangle with a length of 1.0 and three vertices. So here we have the three vertices. And we have this normal that defines like the outward facing uh, direction of the face. So here are these blue lines represent the normals. And you can see in this 3D printed object, you know, the face points at a certain angle and that's defined by the normal. So, um, so let's look at that. So. Uh, here we had our OBJ files, which is just vertices. Um, the OBJs can also define normals. This one just doesn't have it. But now if we look here at this connector as an STL, actually, let me jump back uh, really quick. Let me export this. So I have this connector. It's an OBJ. I'm going to go file. I'm going to select it. Go file export selection. And I'm gonna choose STL export. I already can uh, export it once, we'll export it again, connector two. I'm gonna hit export selection. Oh, file, let me do that one more time, export selection. Okay, you see right here where it says binary on or off, that goes back to the point where I said STLs uh, can take a file form of either ASCII or binary. And this is super important because if I export it as a binary, which I'll do, and I'll just call this connector B. And I'll go in here. Okay, so here's my ASCII representation of an STL file. You can see that it's defined in facets. There's three vertices that make up the triangle. And at the top is the normal that um, defines its outward facing direction. And this is in ASCII format. Now, if I go in here, I have my binary format that I exported. Um, yeah, that was not what I was trying to import. Uh, hold on, connector B. Uh, yeah. Oh, crap. Okay, hold on. Let's see. Let's be over. Uh, 3D viewer disable. Sorry, I have a 3D viewer installed in here. And that's what I was trying to do. Um, okay. Uh, I can't show up, but because I have a 3D viewer installed, let me, and I have to reload it, but let me just open this and open with, and well, I have a 3D viewer installed, but if I tried to open this, in just a, a text program, the binary format, it would look like a bunch of gobbledygook and you couldn't read it. So my point here is that when you're acquiring an SD file, if you're acquiring an SD file, you wanna ask for the ASCII format um, because if you open it a binary, it's written in, it's compiled to machine code. So you, you won't be able to understand it and you won't be able to read it. You, you'll be able to open a 3D program, but if you wanna look at like the vertices, 
and the raw things, it's very important um, to ask for an ASCII file. It's like asking for source code of a computer program that you acquired. So I did want to make that distinction that STLs can either be in binary or ASCII. Okay, so let me go back here. So th that's the difference uh, between STLs and OBJs. And so the big difference is that between STLs and OBJs is meshes is what's displayed on the surface. STLs files don't display any data on the surface of the mesh. They only indicate the surface itself the geometry of the object, how big it is and the shape of its sides. That, but that's about it. STLs are grayscale by default because there's no color or texture data. Uh, OBJ files, on the other hand, incorporate actual photographic imagery or uh, descriptions of the surface. And so they can te contain texture information. Okay, so now let's uh, talk about G code. Um, as I mentioned, GCO is also known as RS-274. It's what's most widely used computer numerical control. Uh, CNC programming language, it's mainly used in computer-aided manufacturing to control augmented machine tools. It has many variants. It stands for geometric code. It tells the computerized machine tools how to move and how to interact in order to produce something. For an example, a 3D printer needs to know how to move the printing head within the workspace when <clears throat> and when to start the flow of material. Uh, G-code has many variants and flavors depending on the machine. And the G-code commands instruct the machine where to move, how fast to move and what, <clears throat> what path to follow. And you can see here, there's a little sample of G-code and uh, they usually start with a letter and a numeric code. And you can look at some references, which I'll show in a second about what these commands mean. Like this is fans, a fan speed setting here. Uh, this is a nozzle setting. This is a tool path on the XY uh, coordinates. And here's an extrusion uh, thing. So let's, let me jump over to my slicer. Um, I'm using Kira. Um, and so let me show you. So in Kira, I, I'm I'm I have it set up for a particular printer, a Creality Ender 2, um, but it knows a lot about a lot of different printers. So if I were to add a new printer, it has all these different vendors, and I can choose that, and it's going to conform the G code, uh, the workspace, all of that to that particular printer. I can also, um, you know go to machine settings and set specific things such as the bed size, the print head settings and things like that and add custom G code at the beginning and the end. Now I have this connector um, and here is nice because I can either drag a, a OBJ or an STL in there. Uh, I can do just basic things like scale it up or scale it down. It has a 3D gizmo as well. It'll fit it on the bed and it'll tell me if it doesn't fit. I can rotate it, um, things like that. And then I have a bunch of other options here uh, that we're talking about. Uh, layer height, wall thickness, this would be the outer shell. Infill density, it's at 20% right now. I can make that 100. I can make it much less. Um, printing temperature based on the substrate I'm using. In this case, I would be using a uh, PLA, which is about 200. Also the build plate temperature for adhesion, uh, which uh, is uh, important for FDM, uh, print speed, uh, cooling, and a lot of other things, and supports. So in this case, so there's overhangs here. And so I want to generate supports. I'll just say everywhere. And I'll generate a raft. And so I set all my options, and then I'm going to hit slice. It starts the slicing process. It goes through uh, with the options I've set um, and analyzes it, converts the STL to G code. It gives me an estimated time, 13 hours and 23 minutes. Um, now, Kira is pretty nice. Oops, sorry, I need to zoom to 
two bars over the way. Shoot. Okay, so here's pretty nice is I have this preview option. And um, I should in the earlier thing, but I can I can see here the, the blue is the supports. And I can uh, take this slider and sort of go through. Zoom in here. And sort of go through and analyze each slice visually. And I can do things like, all right, I'll set the infill density to 75 and give it a different pattern of infill, such as a grid, hit slice there. And it resliced it. And you see that infill is quite dense in a different pattern. I can go ahead and analyze that. And Kira kind of generates these meshy supports. And so I'm going to have to break these off and sand it or do some kind of post-processing afterwards. Um, supports might be uh, dependent on the slicer you're using. Here's another program, uh, Mesh Mixer from Autodesk. And so I generated some supports in here. See, they're very different. They're kind of like these thick tree branches. So that's going to have a different post-processing processing um, effect on the model. Okay, so once I do that, I would export this as G-code. It's going to be G-code specific to my Ender 3. I already um, exported that, so I'm going to go over back to my text editor, and I have that here. And um, Visual Studio Code has some nice plugins. In this case, uh, it has a G code formatter. So, G code language sports, which I installed. And that's nice. It color codes it for me. And I can look at this G code and I can start to see some, some uh, variables here, such as the flavor of this G code is called Marlin. And it gives some time, type of filament. And, that, and then it has a button, it has some, some comments that the slicer generated. And then there's a bunch of stuff down here. Um, well, it looks like it's just going to move the extruder um, to a different X, Y, and Z coordinates. But one thing I can do is there is this nice G code formatter commenter here, which I'll post a link to. And so what I can do is, um, I'll just refresh this. Paste that. Hit the comment code, and it's it's very extensive, and it gives me generates comments, human readable comments for every uh, line of um, G code that I paste in. Additionally, um, I know that this G code flavor is Marlin, and so there's a, a Marlin. Um, reference I can go through and if I wanted to I could look up every single code and do it that way but the commenter is much nicer um, and so that is pretty much what I wanted to demonstrate um, I know I showed these tools uh, Maya which I'm using Maya because I have an academic email address sorry about the doorbell um, but another great uh, program is called uh, Blender. That's free and open source. It's a great example of successful open source 3D modeling software. Um, you can go get that at blender.org if you want to start playing around yourself. And, um, and Visual Studio Code is from Microsoft. It's free and it's an excellent text editor. And um, and it has lots of cool plugins. Okay, and I think I'm at time, so I'm going to stop. And thank you for putting up with my live demo.